Welcome back to our Love and the Enneagram series at Trinity Cathedral. I'm the Reverend Adrian Cook, and I am here today with two Enneagram type nines. And we are in the middle of our um, conversation with the body types. And this week, we are going to hear from the type nine, commonly known as the peacemaker or the mediator. Uh, and the way that the body center works commonly for a type nine, um, as we already know, the body center is, an, is a, a focus of attention on the instinctual drive. And for type nines, this is often an instinct that leans toward what feels comfortable. Um, and so we'll learn about some of the ways in which that's where the focus of attention goes for a type nine. But because our conversation these last few months during COVID has been through the lens of love, uh, I'm gonna focus a little bit of the conversation on the holy idea of the type nine, which is love. And um, we haven't talked too much about holy ideas, but in the Enneagram system, the holy idea is the reflection of the image of God that each type structure is, is hoping to manifest in the self, is drawn to manifest in the self, but the structure of sin, the structure of the ego, um, defense mechanisms gets in the way and sort of twists um, the route that the type structure thinks it needs to take in order to access, in this case, love. Well, I'm gonna invite each of you, um, Alex, if you'd be willing to take the first one um, to read these scripture passages to just sign, kind of set the, um, the framework for what we mean uh, in the biblical sense when we talk about love. Okay. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Hmm. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. I have to say more than any of the other type structures, as I read these and I see the, um, what love does not do, I feel like it could be a part of the Enneagram nine type structure. Um, I don't know if you all. <laughs> I, yeah, I get that. Feel that yeah. at all? Um, I imagine that internally, it's not always easy to to uh, to do the latter half of the paragraph. But I, I don't want to um, assume too much. But I can already see some of the way that the enneagram describes the type nine structure in um, just the way that nine seem to move through the world. So I'm just getting more and more excited about this actually <laughs> uh, through the nines. Um, so here we are. This is just a, um, a, quick map, a quick map of the centers of intelligence in the Enneagram. And we've already moved through the, um, the thinking triad first and the feeling triad. And now we are in the instinctive triad, the body types. And the nine is at the, the top of the, um, the pyramid, top of the triangle. And um, some people think that the nine is uh, the last number uh, in the Enneagram. Uh, we're looking at it numerically, one through nine. But others argue that nine is really the first number because it's the number that, um, that maybe more than any of the others reflects all of the type structures. Nines are known for being um, able to merge with uh, many with people, with places, with um, mm -hmm. um, ideas. And mm -hmm. so the sense that of the nine sort of um, 
this effusive, effusiveness, um, effusive nature um, allows nines more than any other type to sort of tap into the, um, the image of all the types. And so often when I do typing sessions with groups, um, it's, it's the nines that sort of sit there for a while with a little bit of a confused look on their face. Like, I'm not quite sure I can find myself in this. Um, which right, that, that instinct already might indicate um, in a broad stroke, a type nine, um, sort of having to search for the self. But, um, but also, um, uh, I think it points to the nine's ability to really see even themselves in so many other people. And um, so when a nine moves from peacemaker through their own perceptions and experiences and becomes a mediator, really standing in a gap, uh, nines can be quite a powerhouse um, in, uh, in groups and can really become the peacemakers that they always uh, hoped to be. Mm. Um, but this is the ugly thing that always gets in the way for every single type structure, no matter what. And in type nine, uh, we talk about the vice of the type nine as sloth. And now sloth, uh, what, what, we, what we mean by sloth in the Enneagram is not necessarily what we mean by sloth when we're thinking about the seven deadly sins. Um, nines can be quite productive and active in the world. Um, so this isn't about a type structure that just likes to lay on the couch. That's not what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it could be. <laughs> I mean, you know, maybe sometimes. Um, but um, but the, the idea is more like, well, you might find a nine laying on the couch more often if there's something that they have to do for themselves. And so this idea of a spiritual apathy, um, uh, that the nines can fall asleep to themselves. So, so when um, when all that's left to do is the task that's about furthering something about the nine's goals. Um, that's often when sloth or the defense mechanism that we kind of uh, play with with the nine is, is termed narcotization, um, where the nines will use their ability to merge, um, to merge with their surroundings and kind of lose, lose themselves and find that they, um, they used up too much time and now they have no mm -hmm. time to do the thing that they were supposed to do for themselves. Mm -hmm. The one, nine, and the eight are the body types and they are in the triangle on the Enneagram. And what that indicates in terms of um, the, the formation of the Enneagram symbol is that nines are a part of the stabilizing structure within the Enneagram. Um, so when a nine is uh, just on an average day, they, they look a lot like the peacemaker. Um, when they're at a place of stress in their lives, they can take on the anxious responsibility um, of, of the six. Um, and when nines are in a place of security or health, um, they begin to look like a type three, which is the achiever. Um, and they're able to take on um, a lot of the responsibilities for themselves um, that uh, were difficult to access when they were sort of asleep in their type structure. And being a part of the stabilizing um, part of the Enneagram means that as body types, um, the nine rests between the eight and the one. And that means that the eight and the one are have the energy that's sort of pulling on the type nine. So, um, so eights, uh, all of the body types are, um, have anger as their core emotional state. Um, and eights um, manifest or exert this anger outwardly. Um, not, ones are often aware of anger, but they use their defense mechanism to control it. Um, to not allow it to manifest. And nines hold the tension of both and in so doing often have um, the assumption that maybe they don't feel angry or it's hard to access anger. Um, and I don't know if that's either of your experiences where um, um, I was with a type nine once who said um, we were in chaplaincy group together and uh, um, 
we were we had just gone through a situation that happened between a patient and a chaplain and she agreed with everything and she said the only thing i would erase from the board is the word anger i don't think that was there at all and we all laughed because she already knew she was a type nine we knew she was a type nine but she hadn't made the connection that the one thing she wanted to erase from the whole experience was the anger um and so i don't know if that's something that um, you all will be able to speak to um, as we move forward so hold that in your um in your thoughts okay actually you know what we we'll stop there um so let me pull back up my screen here this will be one of those parts that i edit out and uh so let me talk just for a minute about um, holy love. And then we'll do the proposition of the type nine and we'll get to hear the rest of the time from, from the two of you. All right. So the Enneagram nine seeks holy love. But at an early age, holy love is sort of lost to the perception or not understood by the nine type structure as the child is developing. And the result is what some Enneagram teachers call the delusion of the point, the point nine. Now, the delusion is not a belief that there's no such um, lovingness in existence. Um, human beings can't survive without some sense of love, but rather this lovingness um, is perceived as a local phenomenon occurring at particular points of time and space. Um, so the delusion results in the belief that love is conditional, um, which explains to us why we perceive love at one place and time and not at another. Um, on the surface, we sense these wonderful, beautiful feelings sometimes and not others. Some people have it, others don't. It's present in some parts of the universe and not others. But the actual core of this delusion is that love is conditional. And we're talking about love, this is a holy idea, right? This is the manifestation. Um, this is, God is love. We read that in, in 1 John. So, um, so it's losing sight that there is a source of unconditional love. Um, so nines are asleep to themselves in, in, as being connected to this um, unconditional love. Um, the, they lose sight of the awareness that they're already part of the activated whole, that they are actively participating in love at all times. Um, and when in the ego type structure of nine, nines continue to think and believe um, that they're, they're not activated, um, they're not actualized, uh, they're not realized, recognized, seen, um, present. Um, so nines are on this journey of, of, of knowing who they really are. Um, and, and yet the ego structure gets in the way and keeps um, trying to get the nine um, to behave as if nines don't know who they are. And so it's a real tension between this desire for access to um, holy love that sees us fully and knows us fully and um, uh, has created us to engage the world and the nine type structure that says that just can't be true. It can't be true for me. Um, our nines, it's as if you're not the one who's having all of the experiences of realization and understanding. Uh, nines can feel like they're outside of themselves, even as they, a part of them knows themselves. And this is kind of that merging that can happen with nines and the, their environment and other people. So identifying with the delusion of point nine, when a person identifies with this, this point nine delusion, um, the nine then isn't seeing or realizing or believing who they really are. Um, it's almost like to put it kind of strongly, um, the lie is that for a type nine is that I'm not a soul. 
um, an, a, an, an individual manifestation of unconditional love. Um, so that's sort of taking it to an extreme, but it's that sense of like, do I exist? Um, am I real? Um, and love is, is the, um, the signpost that makes it true. Um, but instead, the type structure believes that reality is what the social consensus says it is, hmm. um, what this life, this world says it is, what the personality of the ego says it is. Um, and I'll just say that many of us have feelings of, of inferiority about one thing or another. Um, and, but with the type nine, it's almost like um, the experience of like inferiority for itself, like the a concern of like lacking intrinsic um, presence, um, like a good, good presence. Um, and I'm seeing some deep, deep breaths. And so I don't know if I'm <laughs> saying the right things or if I'm saying things that are, <laughs> are hard to hear. And maybe it's a bit of both. Um, bit of both. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but, but part of this is, um, is why nines, or this is why nines forget the self and maybe distract from the self, narc out, um, to not remember that, um, that they're integral to the workings of the universe. Um, to for, they forget that everything is made of divine love. Um, yes, even you, even you. And when nines remember this, that they're connected to all, um, actively connected to all and to everything, um, things can start to change. Um, the realization that the universe wouldn't exist as it is if you weren't in it. Um, you affect change just by being, just by being. And holy love is a state of being wherein we know ourselves as worthy of being seen, as integral to the whole. And there's a dynamism in, in holy love um, that loosens this grip on self-forgetting and allows a nine to take action once the nine begins to access that reality uh, um, of not merging, but of being a self that is connected to all. Um, and this is what can allow the nine to move forward for the self um, and with the self and with the whole um, all together. So that's my spiel on uh, love with with the Enneagram type nine. But ultimately, I'm not the person that can speak to the type nine the best. We have two nines in the room. I'll claim my nine wing, that um, I'm, a, I'm an Enneagram eight with soft edges because of my nine wing um, and, the, and the peacemaker um, impulse. Uh, so I feel you all there. Um, and I really resonated even as I was listening with some of the inferiority, inferiority pieces, whereas you know, in states of conflict, um, sometimes I double, I double back or I question my own impulses and instincts um, as to whether I should speak up about them or not. And I can feel some of the nine impulse um, in, those, in those spaces. Um, does my thought or opinion really matter here? Um, do I really need to share it or is it not as important as the other ones being, being given? So, um, so I invite that as uh, way too much information for you to uh, bounce off on. Um, but uh, before we go any further, I would love to just have you introduce yourselves. So um, if you would share how you're connected to this Episcopal world and um, how you know you're a type nine. I'll go ahead. Uh, my name is Jess. I am connected to the Episcopal world here in Ohio through a lot of Episcopal friends. Um, I used to attend um, St. Albans, the late, the late great St. Alban in Cleveland Heights. Um, and I'm involved with a group that has since become more um, broadly ecumenical called the Agape, um, Agape group, Taze group. Um, also, I worked at uh, Bellwether Farm for a, for a piece, 
Um, but I'm a, an Episcoposer. I'm not actually Episcopal. <laughs> I love that. I like to be all things as a, as a maybe a nine quality. Um, so I'm denominationally fluid, um, though uh, currently a member of a Methodist church. Um, I, I was introduced to the Enneagram a long time ago, but it wasn't until um, someone I uh, was in a relationship with and actually um, the relationship ended and, and then I was handed a piece of paper and said, and they said, you're a nine, work through your stuff. <laughs> and um, that's how my journey began. Um, and at first I did not identify as a nine, um, but it, reading the descriptions, it kind of hurt the most. Mm -hmm. um, it hit the most home. Um, and I think that idea of holy love and the barriers to it were maybe why I was so confused. Um, and, and difficult, I found it difficult to identify at first because it was just a sort of assumption the world is this way, love is conditional. Um, but yeah. Well, and, and particularly the traumatic way in which um, you received the information sort of cues that love is conditional and that all of mm. the assumptions of the type structure are correct. Um, sure, yeah. And I, I have to say that we share that experience. That's also exactly how I became um, aware of the Enneagram. So um, crazy, yeah. Yeah, so sometimes other people can see it before we can. Um, mm -hmm. And um, tumbling. Yeah, it is. It is. Well, I wonder just before we, we transition to hearing from Alex, if you'd be um, able to share. <laughs> I hate to ask the question because you already said it hurt. It hurt so much. And that's how I knew I was type nine. <laughs> you willing to share what some of those points were that made it obvious to you that maybe you're a type nine as, as much as you're, you're willing to share about that? Sure. I think that one of the really great self-observation pieces of the Enneagram is calling out, calling out the blind spots. So I think that it was, I, I had spent so much energy, I had spent trying to get better at it, um, on bringing all of the disparate pieces together. And the unspoken assumption in that is that if I can only hold them all, all the time, and make as many people and things at peace as possible and harmonious as possible, I will be happy um, and I will be doing what I was put on the earth to do. Um, and I think the realization that the, 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 the shadow sides of that, <laughs> the self forgetting, I mean, and I've done a lot of self work as well but I, doing so also kind of blind with, with the lens of I'm doing this for others or for God um, rather than like just, I think you said, Adrian, just the, the being, the beingness is the living into an embodiment of love. So it, it hurt to think and it, and it made me extremely angry <laughs> for the first time um, to think wow, I've been spending all this effort and that's not the point um, of love. It's not the point. It's not what, nobody's asking me to do that. Um, that's not the way even the faith that I thought that I was a part of, you know, Christ, the way of Christ really is. Um, it has nothing to do with only ever serving the needs of, of others. Um, that's not the main orientation. So I think it was that, that personal hurt there. And then also just no one wants their vice to be sloth. <laughs> I think that hit a little bit close to home. The inertia that I experience in everyday life is really hard. And I, and be, and it's a catch 22 because of that. I, I do resonate with that idea of like conditional love too. So it's a catch 22 because if I, um, feel immobilized by conflict or by the amount that needs to be done, you know, anything like that, responsibilities, 
and then it could, you know, it can be put in the framework of if I don't do this, I won't be loving or I won't be loved. Mm. And it's even more immobilizing. Mm. Um, so, so that hurt a bit to, to read that and be like, oh man, I feel, cal I feel called out. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think the calling out is the key because um, I would argue as a type eight, nobody wants lust to be their vice. <laughs> so, you know, when you see your vice there on paper, you're like, is this not the worst thing anybody could be? Um, yeah. And that might be a sign that that's, that's you know, um, mm. more to the type structure. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I'm really struck just by, um, by the way that you talked about love and, um, knowing that that's your holy idea had me thinking about my own as a type eight, which is truth, and how the type structures twist our pursuit of the holy idea. So, mm -hmm. so for instance, from an eight perspective, um, uh, I desire truth, and if I pursue it from my ego, all I end up doing is creating my truth. Mm -hmm. I don't actually begin to access yeah. the, um, God's truth, it's just mm -hmm. my own. And how I heard you narrate that, like I know that from a personal experience and how I heard mm -hmm. you narrate, narrate um, the pursuit of love, again, even in the story you shared um, of how you learned you're a type nine. But when we try to pursue it directly, um, our ego structure just sends us a bunch of lies um, yeah. as to how to access it. Right. And so the anger you name at the realization of, I can't believe I've been trying to get to something the wrong way for so long. Um, yeah, uh, is another, I think, great point for, particularly for the body, the body types. Um, but, uh, but we can all access anger. And I think that that's part of the experience, pain and anger <laughs> of learning, you know, of coming face to face with um, your ego structure for maybe mm -hmm. the first time, becoming awake to that for the first time. So you narrated that in a really hopeful, helpful way, I think, particularly for those that might be wondering if they're a type nine. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Alex, how do yeah. you know you are a type nine and how are you connected to the Episcopal Church here in Ohio? Sure. So I'm, I'm Alex and I was born and raised in the Episcopal Church in the Diocese of Maryland. And I did the ESC, the Episcopal Service Corps program through Trinity Cathedral and was sponsored for the priesthood by Trinity Cathedral. Um, I'm now priest in charge at Church of the Redeemer in downtown Lorraine, not but I think 45 minutes away from, from you. Um, the Episcopal Service Corps was the first time I was introduced to the Enneagram and the nine was pretty clear for me in a couple of ways. One is um, sloth is a very attractive quality for me. <laughs> um, and I would say in a deeper sense, uh, I think most people who know me know I'm pretty driven and not lazy. It's more, um, a division of the self uh, instead of being like a unified self having a divided self in which uh, you know if I need to go to the dentist I'm gonna take like four months to make that decision even if it's really pressing whereas if I think the church needs to have a new community meal I can feel in my body that it needs to happen and I'm like mm. an immovable rock mm. there's no change in my mind and it will happen mm. and so I have this sort of divided self where in one sense I can be completely driven and sort of um, dip into this almost threeness, and on the other side, I can be completely not driven and incapable of making a decision. And I think some of the the like pain that Jess was mentioning for me comes more from this divided self experience, uh, where I can look at experiences where I'm like very clear and very driven and very in touch with who I think I am, and experiences where I'm not in the same hour. Uh, so that's one way. And then another is that I have always felt from a very small age and I had a very lonely childhood, uh, a close connection to God that is kind of serendipitous and feels very physical in the sense of uh, being walking across a bridge and feeling God's presence in that moment and that everything makes sense and life is beautiful and grounded, even if it's just for a couple of seconds. Um, so there was kind of this dual recognition of one sort of the sinful side of my nature and the other is the, the blessing of, of being aware of God's presence regardless of my actions or, or what I'm 
neglecting to do or what I'm anxious about or what my particular existential dread of that day is. Hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that. There's, there's two points that I'd love to, um, to use to draw out some more information about the type nine. Um, again, for those who might be wondering if this is their type structure. Um, the first is you talked about a kind of stubbornness. Um, you sort of dig your heels in and it's going to happen um, if, if it's about what the church needs. I wonder if, um, if even both of you could speak to um, uh, what that stubbornness is like and how it manifests in like maybe a way that can harm your relationships and then how it manifests in a way that helps and supports um, relationships. And I love Alex that you, you started with it in a way that helps and supports because I've heard so many nines talk about, um, well, my, you know, my, my partner <laughs> says that this is how I <laughs> act when I don't uh, want to do something. And part of what I've, how I've heard nines describe the stubbornness is, well, sometimes I know what I don't want to do before I know what I want to do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that is also true for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, are there, can, can either of you share a little bit about how that kind of manifests in, in both of those ways? And I'm happy to, happy to hear from you, Alex, if anything's coming to mind as we're, as we're having that. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, it comes as a gut reaction. I can tell you straight off what I think is right or should be done. I cannot tell you straight off how I got to that conclusion. So <laughs> yeah. I, I, I feel it first and foremost in my body. And I'm also a nine with an eight wing. So I am okay with taking up a certain amount of space, even though it still feels uncomfortable. Mm. Um, so it, it's very bodily at first. And I, I know it to be true. And it's like this urge and this thing that is overtaking me in a sense. Um, <laughs> And so there's a positive to it because it can also be a contagious energy and, and other people can see that it's uh, something deep within me that re is resonating. Um, the negative side, of course, is that it can also be impulsive <laughs> and not bring other people around to the creative side of it, not invite other people into the decision-making process um, and exclude maybe some of the like more pastoral dimensions of of why somebody might not want to do A, B, or C. Mm -hmm. I love that you attribute some of that to your eight wing. I think that's probably dead on. <laughs> yeah. um, but that stubbornness piece too, that's a, that's a really uh, cool way to connect it. Thank you. Jess, I saw you sort of nodding and thinking through as, as Alex was talking about this. How is that connecting with what manifests in your life? Well, it's really interesting to hear Alex talk about um that eight wing influence i have a pretty heavy one wing influence i would identify with um so when i i think that uh instead of intuiting what i want or what seems good knowing it right away and then digging my heels in it's um intuiting it not knowing i would echo what alex says like not really knowing how i got to that conclusion doubting it because I, am, I'm, I immediately judge, is this right? Mm -hmm. Is this okay? Um, I don't know. There's got to be some sort of objective okay or best way mm -hmm. to do whatever this is. Um, so it becomes a sort of indecisiveness and a pursuit. The stubbornness is more uh, manifest for me in a pursuit of what's going to feel like it's right. Mm -hmm. Or... Um, wanting others to understand where I'm coming from. Um, and uh, <laughs> so, so I guess that manifests sometimes the negative way it might manifest. I'm thinking of some interactions I've had recently with my partner where um, she's a seven and she'll want to drive things forward um, and um, very active and I'm like putting on the brakes so much to try to discern, is this, is this right? Like, how do I feel about this? And so I dig my heels in and it's like, no, 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 wait, slow it down. It's like, if it feels right, I will fight for it. I will, I will be 100% there, I'm in. Um, but I have to 
wait until I, I settle into the feeling of like, okay, what exactly am I feeling? Do I understand it? Am I able to articulate it? Um, and then fight for it. Uh, but I think that that can be positive because, uh, yeah, I, I'm also pretty gut forward. <laughs> so, so I think it, it can encourage people in my life to recognize that there's, you know, not always, you don't always have to use logic to make decisions. You can use a sense and that sense sometimes isn't nameable, but um, I, I feel often that I kind of just naturally have a pulse on mm -hmm. whatever, <laughs> whatever aspect of, of creation that should be considered. Um, mm. Yeah. Mm. So many places I want to go uh, with, with both of the, the things that you both said. This is so exciting. Okay, so my brain's exploding. Um, so one thing I want to highlight for folks watching, if you've never heard of the wings, um, we've just had two great examples and explanations of how the two possible wings for a type nine manifest. Um, so if you look at the Enneagram numbers, uh, in this case, the nine, either number on either side of the nine can be a wing. Some types claim they have no wings, some will claim they have two. Um, most feel as though they lean toward one or the other and maybe even at different points in their lives. Um, so Alex shared his connection as a peacemaker but with the wing of a challenger. So you can imagine how a peacemaker and a challenger um, might come together in the type structure and that's the inverse of, of mine. So um, so it's kind of cool to hear someone else um, sharing the other side of that coin. Um, and then just shared the nine uh, peacemaker with the one perfectionist and named really well the, the sense of what is right or what is good, what is good being one of the major concerns of the perfectionist um, structure. And so the way that wings work is they just kind of flavor the they flavor the, the core number and um, the core number remains the same. Um, so both, both would identify their, um, their motivations and defense mechanisms coming from a type nine, but the way that they move through the world can look different um, and have some different impulses. And uh, particularly in the way that Jess was just narrating, narrating but I also think I heard Alex use this word, um, what I feel. And when, uh, nines as a body type, when any of the body types are using the word feel, it's often indicating intuition. Um, so when we were with the heart types, they're feeling, but they're, they're using emotional words left and right. And the gut types say, well, I feel this way. And there may not be a cognitive connection to an emotional word, but it's what should be happening. Um, mm -hmm. It's the right thing. It's the way we go. It's um, and that's, those are the signs of a gut type, um, one who relies heavily on intuition. It's juicy. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, um, something else that you talked about, Alex, uh, was this ability for you as a nine to access, even if just for a few moments, the sense of God's presence. And the example you gave was walking across a bridge, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And I've heard so many nines talk about, um, and even uh, even say in some of our pre-conversation, um, Alex asked Jess a question, and Jess was sharing from a story from her personal life, and I heard the connection in there to nature, um, to being outdoors. And this is something that seems so common for a type nine to not just do stuff outdoors, which we can all do, but to feel deeply connected in a spiritual way to um, to to the um, to, to nature, to creation. So I wonder if, if um, you all could speak to that from your own experiences. Yeah, that, that is, uh, yeah, that is so deep. That, that was another piece that um, whatever description I initially read of the nine, that was the thing that probably caught my eye first was the identification, whoever wrote it, it was written in often, often a deep, resonance or relationship with the natural world. Um, that's what made me take, take a, a second look. I've always felt like um, non-human creation is an extension of my own body. Mm. Um, what's, you know, that, that 
it is absolutely core to my experience of the world, um, to my experience of faith. Um, I, I do, yeah, on a very core level, I've not, um, I get irked by the artificial separation of human, human affairs from so-called natural affairs. Um, it's all one, absolutely. Um, we're just able to put words to existence in a particular way. So the kinship, mm. the kinship I feel with non-human creation is run, runs really deep. Mm. Um, and I, I could earnestly say like my faith, I would not be in this faith without that connection, without the ministry of love through non-human creation hmm. um, and, and how that manifests reality to me. Do you think that uh, creation is an access point, maybe an early access point for nines to begin to experience the pervasiveness of love, of, of connectivity and love, even if the nine hasn't yet identified it with those words or for mm. the self but like knowing your own merging with yeah the innocent world oh my goodness yeah absolutely both in the uncon like the true nature of unconditionalness that is just captivating i think you know this the the blueness of the sky you, i i i understand why people sometimes project their own experience onto the world but my experience of of the non-human world has been like, it's gonna go on without me no matter what. And, and the love is just gonna continue to pour, you know, the blueness of the sky, the warmness of the breeze. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that, but then also the pain uh, and ache of desiring to have union um, with that, mm -hmm. with love, be a part of it. Mm -hmm. um so alternatingly i've experienced being most at home in my body and in myself um for example when i'm rambling through the woods and also this essential yearning to to even to be even deeper mm -hmm. <laughs> um into that into the body of god into the body of creation um as a as a human being mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. don't know if that makes sense it does. It does. And I, I'm having this imagery in my head of what I sense is sort of the longing of the type structure, which is the assumption that for me to become a part of love, that, um, I have to be like the drop of water in the ocean, like a complete mm. merging that can no longer be separated. Mm. But that in some ways, the invitation and that, I guess that, that may very well be true in an eternal, from an eternal perspective. But it may also not be true from an eternal perspective. And the, the, the invitation of the, um, that the Enneagram seems to offer the type nine structure is almost more like, um, I don't know, becoming um, a grain of sand that that is taught that is a part that is tossed in the ocean that sometimes is stirred up and swims in it and sometimes is resting and um mm -hmm. but some sort of distinct unique manifestation of love mm -hmm. that remains so always and yet is still a part of the ocean mm -hmm. uh, um, an integral part the bed in fact of it that holds it up right mm -hmm. so so the 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 empowerment of being a part of it that has a role to play in in the exchange versus um versus versus emerging and getting lost and how um how tempting it is for a nine to stay in the merging without also sort of uh, allowing themselves to be separate yeah. individuate yeah yeah. Individuate. yeah it's that's painful to individuate in a different kind of way mm -hmm. <laughs> Very vulnerable me. Alex, if there's anything that you wanted to add to this conversation on sort of individuation and merging and nature, um, please do feel free. Yeah, I would, um, 
I love nature and I love gardening and I would even open it bigger than, I mean, I don't know if there's, this is a real division, but I would open it to even bigger than that. Uh, one of my favorite poems is by Hayden and it has the line, what did I know of love's lonely offices? Hmm. And I often think about like part of being a nine is experiencing love in like a hot cup of coffee to human yes. interaction, to a beautiful tree, to like a beautiful moment in the garden, to observing over time the changing of the seasons. But it's very much about this uh, for me as nine, uh, a presence to it regardless of what it may be. So it doesn't have to be like something that's classically beautiful, like oh, there's a Lake Erie sunset and a couple who's clearly in love kissing each other. It could be like, there's a concrete wall next to the closed steel mill in Lorraine. And somehow it still resonates with a feeling of, of love and purpose and meaning. Mm. Uh, and I feel, I feel present to that. And uh, it provides comfort and a sense of, of meaning as well for me. I'm curious, um, so I'm, th I'm thinking about uh, theories I don't know super well, but that I've heard about, uh, scientific theories that indicate that an environment is changed even just by the observation of someone. Like, um, uh, if, if a camera is set up just outside of the bounds of an environment, um, that, that even an observation of some kind changes the environment. I don't, have, I don't know if this theory, if I know it well enough to even explain it well, but it's, okay. it's running through the back of my mind as I'm listening to you both um, and the effusive ways in which, especially Jess, I was, you were just like soaking in all of Alex's words as truth and in your experience um, of this ability to be present to um, love in the world what is it like for you when the world you're being present to sees you like sees that you're there and i don't know if there's like an example but kind of the lens gets turned from observation mm -hmm. um, um is, is there an emotional experience there is that am i getting too um too heady without an example or well, am I being observed in a way that's like supportive and fun yeah. or is it conflict? Because <laughs> I don't care if people observe me or if I'm playing a leadership role, but as soon as there's conflict, it's like <laughs> <laughs> Check it out. Okay. Is that where your brain was going, Jess, or where was your... For sure. I think it depends on the type of observation. It's like, are we talking panopticon or are we talking mm -hmm. um, you know, the loving gaze mm -hmm. of someone who's, who knows you? I think that there are ways in which it can be very abrupt. I love mm. I to add to what Alex was saying, like um, those experiences of environment as being loving. Mm. Um, being alone is, is a place where I really feel like I can settle into love, um, where no one is observing me because I can remember that I'm a being, <laughs> can remember that, I'm, that I exist. There's no one to, there's no one to um, merge into or be, uh, feel like I have to be aware of. So if that is interrupted by, you know, uh, an eyeball <laughs> on me, I can easily slip back into that almost performative reality. Um, but if the, if the gaze is loving or inquisitive, hmm. um, like I, what actually immediately comes to mind is a moment um, I was, I was backpacking and, um, for the better part of an hour, uh, a little, uh, New Zealand Robin hopped up and got very close to me and just turned his head and looked at me mm. okay. and this way and this way <laughs> and then would hop around and being beheld by another creature, um, it's extremely it just added a really a new level of of that experience of love abroad in the world yeah yeah being being observed by by the other <laughs> and not othered in the process 
Yes, that's a beautiful, beautiful example. Uh, and that's exactly the kind of experience I was curious about. You literally gave a, a perfect example there. Um, uh, at Alex, I felt like in, in what you were saying, um, I was able to think about uh, conflict for the nine in a different kind of way. Um, uh, um, so Jess, you've, you've really been narrating quite clearly the like the, the sense of the unbroken um, um, experience of love in in the environment. Um, and Alex, when you mentioned like, well, it depends on whether it's a loving gaze or it's conflict. Um, uh, that that conflict is really maybe so harsh because it it um, it goes directly against the longing of that merging with love that you you get snippets of and and um and it, it it almost felt like a someone taking a knife and just like slicing slicing connection which is what i heard described you know in sort of the narrative of well love only, love happens in pockets here and there and then eventually it gets sliced it just gets like chopped off and is that kind of what conflict feels like mm -hmm. This is my own words, so you know I can be wrong. I mean, I think, I think that's still too petty of a way of describing it. That's probably where I would get to a week or four after the conflict. <laughs> but at first, it, it, it really, at first, it just feels like stomach acid. <laughs> <laughs> and it feels like deeply uncomfortable. Um, and instead of a slicing off, it, I would say it feels more like a roadblock than a slicing off. Mm. Um, and, and even when I think the conflict is good and righteous, it still has that feeling of a roadblock. And even if I'm engaged in the conflict, it still has that feeling. Um, like that feeling has never gone away from me um, mm. in conflict. But yeah, it feels more like a roadblock than a slicing off. What what would the road? What would it be a roadblock to? Uh, getting back to non-conflict. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that that sense of comfort and connection. Yeah, getting back getting back to that, and I think my my ego brain whatever might delude myself into saying to getting back onto mission as well. Mm. Um, because I know in my brain that conflict is often necessary for A, better outcomes, B, deeper relationships, C, people actually feeling heard, all these things, right? Um, so I think sometimes I can delude myself into thinking that conflict, not only is it a roadblock from comfort, but it can be a roadblock from, mm. from the mission, right? Which is not... Right, it's part, it's part of part of the system that actually keeps the, keeps, keeps the movement happening, yeah. 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 Yeah, Anything you want to add to that, Jess, or any thoughts that came to mind? Yeah, I think that's pretty resonant. Um, yeah, roadblock idea. I think, too, in that moment, <laughs> corrosiveness, like that stomach acid feeling, mm -hmm. or um, just like a very foundational corrosiveness that it's like, this isn't loving. <laughs> why, you know, why? why do we have to be in a place of conflict there's there's nothing that's good about this is is sort of my it's the the instinct that i have to work through to remember the good that can come and i have to actively you know keep my <laughs> keep standing in the pool of acid of conflict mm. um for you know to to move on mm. um yeah yeah Thank you both. Um, I am going to read here just another kind of talking point to launch us. Um, I'm going to read a bit on the basic proposition of the type nine and we'll see some of the language will be stuff we've already talked about. There might be a couple of new things in here and um, and let's just see if it generates any any further reflections. So as we've already named in so many different ways, um, Type nines believe that belonging and comfort are gained by attending to and merging with others and by dispersing energy into substitute objects. So energy that's maybe meant for the self, but is 
being dispersed into not the self. Um, the focus of attention, the habitual focus of attention, can be on what is inessential. So I remember I heard Alex say, uh, you know, I might have to make a doctor's appointment and it might be urgent, but it'll still take me four months to, to get there. Um, so there's something- the dentist. the dentist, yeah, just the dentist, you know, who flosses anyway, right? Um, so the, the sense of something, um, um, that's really important gets put on the sidelines, particularly when it's about the self and the inessential things might, might get a highlight um, in order to distract from that self um, need to be met. So um, another way that can manifest is focus of attention on the agendas of others. Oh, I'm great. How are you? Um, oh, things are going well with me. What's going on in your world? Um, sort of a flip of that focus of attention. And in part why I was curious about, oh, what happens when the focus of attention gets flipped back? You know? Um, mm. uh, so uh, what some other mediators tell us about themselves is that they like to see all sides of pretty much every issue, um, particularly if they can be observant to it rather than like if it's sort of a conflict situation, you know, not be a part of it, but really still hear all the sides, um, <laughs> um, be present to that. Um, I love the word presence. That's a great nine word, better than, better than observe, um, to be present to all sides of every issue. And then to have a role as like a harmonizer, um, how to find the ways in which we might have some common, common ground. Uh, instinct is to avoid conflict and want a comfortable solution to whatever we're we're looking at. Um, sometimes a difficulty in saying no. I'd be curious to hear from both of you on your experience of that because um, uh, I've heard you with clarity name your own perspectives today. So it tells me that you there's a there's a journey of of understanding and knowing with maybe the common difficulty of saying no, um, and maybe how that manifests or, or how that has changed over time. Um, some other nines say that they're ambivalent about their own needs and wants. Um, ambivalence is a word that might pop up. And the common phrase is, I'll just go along to get along. Like, uh, uh, I was, my brother's a nine and, um, I remember a conversation of trying to pick out a restaurant and um, anytime um, I threw just one idea out there, it was always like, well, yeah, that sounds fine. That sounds fine. But if I would give a few ideas and I said, tell me which ones you don't want, he could do that. No problem. Um, and so uh, the impulse was to go along and to kind of leave some options for the other person to sort of access. Um, I, uh, I mean, it's a growing edge. I think I made some progress on the ability to say no. And part of that is out of sloth, right? You, once you realize that what you've said yes to everything, you can't also be sloth like about all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so part of it's just a self-preservation thing. And, and then the other part is more positive, just a growth in the ability to, to say no. With the note that it still doesn't feel like it still doesn't feel good. Mm. And one of the things that came up when you're talking about it is sometimes when I encounter other types encountering me, it mm. feels as if they think there's a lot of conscious intent in what I'm doing. <laughs> and there's not a lot of <laughs> conscious intent. And so when they ask the question or turn the observation on me through their own process where there would have been a lot of conscious intent, I'm like, I have no idea. So sometimes it is a, a a way of avoiding conflict other times it is truly an inability to put into words mm. like why is it that i've arrived at this situation because mm. um, i didn't arrive in the same way you did <laughs> i got here and now i'm here and it was probably through like thousands of subconscious calculations of people <laughs> and all of that but i don't know how it happened and it wasn't like a malicious intent <laughs> Uh, that's a really helpful way of, of narrating this, Alex, um, particularly as I look at the slide that we've got up. Um, if we notice that 
for nines to access their head connection, which is at point six, nines have to be in a place of stress. So the nines impulse to perpetually be in a state of comfort would encourage the nine to not access the, the easy access to head point, which is what stress can offer. So when like conflict occurs, it sounds like it's, it's sometimes one of the first moments where you're forced to think about mm -hmm. what your intuition was, was guiding you toward. Um, so that's, there's almost this benefit to conflict in, in that regard as well, because it gets you to maybe think and explain or um, defend at times it might feel like. Um, but, but make your own process known, not just to the other, but to yourself for the first time. Um, yeah. um, I had never quite thought about it that way, the ways in which sometimes the stress point can, uh, can, can be to our benefit. I mean, I, I know that in my own narrative as an eight, um, my, my head point is also my stress point. And um, if I didn't, uh, if I wasn't in such an extreme state of stress uh, after my relationship breakup, I wouldn't have explored the Enneagram uh, with as much detail as I did. So the anxieties helped me to really s stop and think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We were talking, we were just talking a little bit about kind of going along with the flow. It's one of the last things I think you mentioned in that narrative, Adrian. Um, how that's what that's what maybe naturally feels best is going along with the flow. It seems like the ultimate good, a lot of good can come from that. Um, that can be very healing <laughs> to others. Um, but it takes like a little bit of fire to um, to sometimes come alive. Um, so it's it's sort of like the flow. The flow is the comfort zone. Um, if I were drawing this, like that little curve would like start to like trickle off into a bit of a puddle. Because <laughs> I think that that's, that's what happens is, you, you know, that, that eventually is like, why do I feel so awful? Oh, I haven't, I have all this pent up anger and um, I actually do exist and I have my own needs. Um, so that, that resonates in this picture. I mean, yeah, the including anger, and I think more and more about it as I've been a priest for a little bit now about how, you know, I'm angry because I love people I serve. Mm -hmm. And I'm angry that mm -hmm. I wouldn't even say I want everyone to be happy. I would say I want everyone to not be in pain mm -hmm. would be how I'd put it. And mm -hmm. my anger is kind of on this scale with a desire for harmony and mm -hmm. meaning and peace. And the less I see that for others, the more angry I am. Um, and so there's a love in the anger and that's how I sort of mm. become more comfortable with it is recognizing that uh, my anger comes out of a place of love as well. Uh, wow, 20 years ago, I imagine your type structure would think you were speaking another language that anger was what would get you, get you to, to deepen your sense of what love is. <laughs> it's beautiful. That's, I that's mean, I still have the like, crappy versions of it as a nine where it like, comes out of nowhere and everyone's like, whoa, I didn't know he was thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just blame it on the eight wing again. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I appreciate both of you. Um, it was a very fluid conversation and um, you really shared a lot of the particularities of your individual experiences um, of a type nine. And so that the individuation that we talked about a bit um, really shined. And I think that that's a, a, a great example to be able to give those who maybe feel kind of stuck in their nine type structure, that there is not just a way to kind of break out of the suffering that, that the structure can sometimes bring, but to break out of it in such a way that deepens the connection to love um, by deepening that connection to self. Um, you're able to connect more in the ways that you've always wanted to. Um, and that's, that's, a, uh, that's an Enneagram poster child uh, uh, picture right there. So I appreciate that you both brought that out. Mm -hmm. 
to close our time, I'd love to offer a prayer from um, one of my mentors and colleagues, Sandra Smith. Um, she's a spiritual director and an Enneagram type eight, and she has written prayers for each of the types and, um, and it addresses God in um, a way that's different for each of them. And for the type nine, she addresses God as the unconditional lover. And so I invite you to pray with me to our holy lover. Unconditional lover, create in me a refuge for remembering myself, a safe place where I can go deep and explore the full range of who I am. Dissolve my fears of my anger, Holy One, so that I may allow it to guide me in knowing what matters to me and what the matter is. Empty me now of my resistance to my inner journey, my resistance to waking up to my life. Remind me of my own lovability so that in loving myself, I may genuinely love others and in this loving, show up in the peaceful times and in the difficult ones. I no longer want to deprive myself of my life, holy lover of my heart. Be my foundation as I honor my life and my relationships by offering my own aliveness and my full being each day. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being companions on this Enneagram journey. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation.